In episode one of season two, all of the Hargraves children are sent back in time to the same alley in Dallas, Texas, only they're sent back in different years. Klaus and Ben arrive in 1960, with Allison arriving in 1961, Luther arriving in 1962, Diego arriving in September of 1963, Vanya arriving in October of 1963, and then finally number five arrives in November of 1963. But he arrives to a very different alley, because the Soviets have invaded the United States and there is a war going on. And Five's first thought is, alright, what did we do now? But to his surprise, when he goes out to the streets, all of the Hargraves' children are fighting alongside each other, and fighting against the Soviets. Diego says to him, Hey, it's about time you showed up. But then Hazel shows up and says, hey, if you want to live, come with me. Because those things in the sky right there, those are nuclear weapons. And everybody here is about to get blown off the map. And Five, who realizes that he can't save his family if he's dead, goes with him. So Hazel and Five travel back to the same location just 10 days earlier. And Hazel's not really interested in helping Five. He's really just fulfilling a promise to Agnes on her deathbed. Agnes died of cancer, but they had 20 good years. And as they're making small talk about the commission, all of a sudden these three albinos get off a bus and draw guns at both Hazel and Five. And Hazel slips something into Five's pocket, hands him the briefcase, and gets lit up. Five is able to get away and evade these guys, but the briefcase is shot to bits. He then goes back to the alley that he arrived in and notices that there's a place that has a camera set up, filming and taking pictures of the alley. So he heads into there to find a conspiracy theorist. And this guy used to just sell TVs and radios in this place until three years ago when Klaus showed up. He tells Five that five times in the past three years, there's been an electrical anomaly, a blue light, and then someone appears in that alley, and he wasn't quite sure what was going on, but he's got pictures of aliens and newspaper clippings all typed up. So Five is looking at the pictures, and sure enough, you know, it's his brothers and sisters, and he asked the conspiracy theorist, a guy named Elliot, if he knows where any of these people are, and the only person's location that he knows of is Diego's, because there's a newspaper clipping about this crazy guy who was arrested and thrown in an insane asylum. And in that insane asylum, Diego's been locked up because he keeps talking about how somebody wants to kill the president in a few days and he needs to stop it. And they chalk it up to just a guy with a hero complex, which... Diego kind of does have. So Five goes to visit him to tell him that the world is once again going to end in 10 days. But all Diego can think about is getting out of there and saving the president's life. Even after Five explains that Diego saving the president's life probably started a nuclear war, all Diego can focus on is the fact that he was able to do it. He was able to save Kennedy's life. And Five doesn't want to let that happen. It's the butterfly effect. So he realizes that he can't rely on Diego and tells the guards, hey, by the way, he's planning an escape so that they'll lock him up and he can't get out. Now, the other Hargraves children are either in Dallas or slowly making their way back, like Klaus and Ben, who were out in California for a while, and Ben never wanted to leave California and is really being dragged against his will back to Dallas because, you know, he's still dead. And they get into a fight about that and a fight about Klaus allowing their car to break down. So the two are forced to walk to this bar in the middle of nowhere and ask the bartender, hey, do you know when the next bus to Dallas is? And he says, yeah, tomorrow at 3 p.m. And Klaus is wearing this flamboyant outfit in the middle of Texas. So he's kind of getting some guff from the bar patrons who ask him, hey, do you want to play some poker? Thinking that he can be an easy mark. But Klaus is taking them for all their money. And one of the guys there is kind of sick of losing, so he's trying to bully Klaus out of a huge pot and offers to put up more than the money. He wants Klaus to put up his necklace. And Ben, who is behind this guy, tells Klaus, by the way, he's bluffing. So Klaus obliges and says, okay, well then put up the keys to your car because that could be their way to Dallas. But when the guy puts his cards down, Ben screwed him over because the guy is a full house. And that was something that Klaus is shocked to learn of, but he still grabs the keys. The guys want to fight him and Klaus tries to harness the powers of Ben, but Ben says, no, I'm going to sit this one out being petty. So it forces Klaus to run out of the bar, hop in the truck, and get the hell out of there. Although they're arrested for stealing the car shortly after they arrive over the Dallas border. Then there's Allison, who is married a political activist named Raymond. And both Raymond and Allison are very active in the African-American community in Dallas. Shortly after Allison arrived, she saw the segregation firsthand when she entered a bar and it said whites only. And Raymond is really excited about President Kennedy and the future. And Allison who knows what happens to Kennedy, tells him, I just don't want you to get your hopes up because she still hasn't told him where she came from or about her powers. And Allison's doing pretty well for herself. She owns her own salon where both her and Raymond hold community gatherings to talk about how to enact social change for their people. But one night as they're having one of those meetings, this racist from across the street comes over and demands to know why they're having a gathering that late at night. And when Raymond basically touches his foot, he claims that he was assaulted 
And that's when Allison actually jacks him up. And this future MAGA bro has to leave with his tail between his legs in a seersucker suit. Now, Vanya crawled out of that alley delirious and was hit by a car. And the family that hit her has taken her in because Vanya doesn't remember anything. And she's been staying with this family for about a month, taking care of their child named Harlan, who doesn't speak. And while the woman of the household named Sissy likes having Vanya around, the man of the household named Carl seems to want to get her out of there, constantly posting ads in the classifieds about a missing woman. And Carl is kind of a jackass, he's a salesman, and that night he heads out to meet with a client, saying that he would be back late. That same night, Vanya can't sleep and heads into the kitchen to find Sissy smoking, and the two go off to the barn to smoke outside and have a chat about how Carl and Sissy met at a young age, and how Sissy had to give up her dreams. Sissy also tells Vanya that she has a coffee can with a bunch of money squirreled away, but not to leave Carl. It's actually in preparation of Carl leaving her, either on his own or by death. And while she does like Carl, it doesn't really seem like she's that in love with him. And then finally there's Luther, who's working as a bodyguard for a club owner. He's also doing these underground fights for money. And one of the guys in the club that night just so happens to be Carl, Sissy's husband. And Carl is talking to the owner, Mr. Ruby, about a business opportunity, but he is drunk. And as Luther is talking to one of the waitresses, asking if that guy's a problem over there, she says, no, not yet. The person I'm actually worried about is the kid over there. And the kid is number five. But Luther doesn't really want to have anything to do with five because he's still pissed off for leaving him in the 60s. But five tells him, we don't have time to squabble like this. We have 10 days to wrangle everybody up because the world ending followed us. It's going to happen again. But Luther says, I don't really care and walks off. But Luther should care because Diego, who was locked up in the insane asylum in one of those padded rooms, has picked his way out. He ends up stumbling down the hallway and getting caught by an orderly, but the orderly is knocked out by a girl named Lila. And Lila and Diego have kind of formed a friendship in the asylum. But there are alarms going off. And it's not for Diego, it's because the three albinos have broken in there and are trying to track him down. Diego unlocks all of the doors, letting everybody out as to cause a distraction, and he is able to get away. Thank you for watching this recap. If you do not see the next one up in the corner right there on the end screen, don't worry, it'll be up shortly. Please consider following the channel. That'd be cool. If you like the video, give it a thumbs up. And if you don't, there's a thumbs down button for a reason.